Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Oh my god, we're back after a little bit of a break. We are. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, your creator and host, and with me again, Matthew. Hello, everybody. How are you this week, sir? I am good. Settling back in. Settling back in. Yeah. Uh, were you unsettled prior or? No, well, it's was just a busy few weekends and I was traveling last weekend. Oh, you were traveling? Yeah. Right. You were in Edmonton. Edmonton. Yeah. How was that? It was fun. Spent some time with the family. There you go. Saw rugby, had a techno dance off with my nine and five year old cousins. That sounds like fun. It was a lot of fun. Well, let's do this thing. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Batteries not included. Well, no, you don't need batteries for poutine. <laughs> Starting in 1963 and stretching over the next seven years, a militant French separatist group called the Front de Libération du Québec terrorized La Belle Provence. Their aim was to overthrow the Quebec government and leave Canada, creating an independent Marxist-Leninist Quebec state. By 1970, the group had committed more than 200 violent criminal and terroristic acts, including bombings and high-profile kidnappings. The group's activities ultimately claimed the lives of eight people, including a Quebec provincial cabinet minister, and injured many more. Until then-Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, finding himself out of options, enacted the 1914 War Measures Act to stem the violence in October of 1970. You are listening to Dark Poutine Episode 189, The FLQ, Seven Years of Terror and the October Crisis. As the bulk of these events took place over 50 years ago, many Canadians, including myself, are too young to remember the terroristic misdeeds perpetrated by the FLQ. As I researched this story, I was stricken by the staggering number of crimes that the organization was involved in. Although every event is relevant, and I do not want to minimize the trauma caused by each and every one of them, they were all memorable for the victims as well as terrorized Quebecers, who were wondering if they would be targeted next. However, I felt that reciting a list of every occurrence and every offender associated with the FLQ might make for tedious listening and a very long podcast, so I chose to focus on some of the most egregious and destructive crimes while only highlighting others. For a full list, please see the Wikipedia link titled Timeline of Front de Libération de Québec, which is first in this episode's show notes. I am not a political scientist or a sociologist. I do what I can here to describe in my limited perception and understanding the Quebec sovereignty movement. I want to ensure that I do not wish to conflate the FLQ's actions with those beliefs held by peaceful separatists. They are very different stories. They are not branches of the same tree. But one tale cannot be told properly without referring to the other. Since Confederation in 1867, there have been Québécois unhappy with Quebec's inclusion among the other Canadian provinces. 
In fact, Quebec was, in effect, its own sovereign state from 1791 until 1840 when the process of confederation began and life within the province began to change to fit with the vision of confederation. The ideal of the separatist movement is, at the very least, that Quebec should be treated not only as a distinct culture and society based on ancestral tradition, the French language, and a culture heavily based in the beliefs of the Catholic Church, giving them a special status within Canada, and at the most extreme, a completely sovereign country. From Britannica.com, quote, The movement was motivated primarily by the belief shared by many Quebec intellectuals and labor leaders that the economic difficulties of Quebec were caused by English-Canadian domination of the Confederation and could only be ended by altering or terminating the ties with other provinces and the central government, end quote. So during the 1960s, the culture in Quebec began to undergo what has been referred to as the Quiet Revolution, a period of unbridled economic and social development in the province. The FLQ, though, were not quiet, like the typically non-violent separatists, the large majority of whom believe in democracy and the rule of law. The FLQ was anything but. These radicals, resented anything representative of Anglo-colonialism within Quebec's borders and vowed to exercise Quebec of any and all Anglophone influence. According to William Tetley in his book The October Crisis 1970 An Insider's View, it is believed that revolutions in 17 African nations that had obtained their independence and a successful Marxist revolution carried out in Cuba had stimulated some young Quebec radicals to seek a worker state in a separate Quebec. The roots of the FLQ can be traced to the founding of a number of leftist separatist organizations that began to spring up in 1957 and continued into 1962 with the formation of Réseau de Résistance, the RR, by a group of militants expelled from an earlier separatist group, Rassemblement pour l'Independence Nationale, RIN. They were expelled for their radical and often violent ideals. On January 22, 1963, Marcel Chaput, having been expelled from the RIN only two days earlier, declared, quote, Several members of the executive of the RIN wish to achieve the independence of Quebec and to create an idealistic society, while I and those who follow me wish to separate but maintain the Quebec society we have. There were many rifts already within the separatist movement. This lack of agreement on fundamental ideas is most likely what has prevented them from being successful in their goals. In early February, RR members Gabriel Houdon, Georges Chautier and Raymond Villeneuve founded the Front de Libération de Québec, the FLQ. On February 23, 1963, the group committed their first act of terrorism when members tossed a Molotov cocktail through the window of the English-language radio station CKGM in Montreal. The RR, and subsequently the FLQ, took responsibility for the bombing. Two weeks later, under cover of darkness, during the early morning hours of March 8, 1963, three military barracks located in Montreal and Westmount were set on fire by the FLQ using incendiary bombs. On the same day, the FLQ released a communique entitled Notice to the Population of the State of Quebec, According to sources for William Tetley's book, October Crisis, the communique described the FLQ as a revolutionary movement made up of volunteers ready to die for the cause of political and economic independence of Quebec. Attacked would be all colonial symbols and institutions, factories which discriminate against French-speaking workers, all vested interests of American colonialism, the natural ally of Canadian-English colonialism. Quebec can only become independent by social revolution. Students, workers, farmers, form your secret groups to fight Anglo-American colonialism, independence or death. Attacking a symbol of British colonial rule at the end of March 1963, the FLQ unbolted and broke a statue of British General James Wolfe. Wolfe had defeated French troops under the Marquis de Montcalm, leading to the surrender of Quebec to the British during the Battle of the Plains of Abraham on September 13, 1759, during the Seven Years' War. 
On April 1, 1963, three FLQ bombs exploded around Quebec. One explosion happened at a federal tax building. The second blast occurred at the central station located in Montreal, and a third blew up along a railway belonging to the CN Railroad. The bomb that had been set to explode along the CN Railway was discovered before the passing of the train transporting then-Prime Minister of Canada, John Diefenbaker. He exclaimed, Is this Ireland? upon learning of the attempt on his life. Five days later, authorities discovered a bomb consisting of 24 sticks of dynamite that had been set to blow up the Radio Canada transmission tower on Mount Royal. Thankfully, the bomb was poorly constructed and did not detonate. On April 16, 1963, the first manifesto of the FLQ was distributed. It called for the separation of Quebec, citing shrinking population of Francophone Canadians claiming British colonialism as the reason why, and stopped just short of calling it a cultural genocide. The manifesto ends with the exhortation, Patriots of Quebec to arms. The honor of national revolution has come, independence or death. The first death attributed to the FLQ occurred less than a week later. On April 21, 1963, the FLQ set off a bomb at the Canadian Forces Recruitment Centre at 772 Sherbrooke Street West in Montreal. A 65-year-old night watchman named William O'Neill was killed in the blast. Journalist André Laurendo wrote in Le Devoir, quote, The hidden ones have killed. It had to happen. One does not play with fire unpunished. This time they've done it. A man has been killed, whether by error or deliberately. The FLQ have gone the whole way to crime. These are the fireworks of hate. End quote. According to William Tetley, the bomb that killed O'Neill was made by Andre Villeneuve, one of the three founders of the FLQ, who apparently said at the time, quote, I am not at all concerned. If you ask me my opinion, I did not kill enough Anglos. I should have killed more, end quote. Montreal police and the RCMP began rounding people up, suspected of being involved in the crimes and connected to the FLQ. But even though some were being held, the violence continued on. The governments of the city of Montreal and the province of Quebec set up rewards for the capture of FLQ members at $60,000 and $50,000 respectively, quite a sum at the time. From Darcy Genish's book, the making of the October crisis, quote, Blue-collar Montrealers were equally appalled to judge from a rough sampling of opinion that appeared in the weekly newspaper Le Petit Journal. The paper sent a reporter into the street to pose a question. What do you think of the acts of sabotage of the FLQ? The paper published the answers on Sunday, April 21st. They're a bunch of sick individuals, said truck driver Conrad Barrett. They've got no brains and no plan said taxi driver Conrad Boulanger. If I were police and I caught them, I'd hang them by the feet from a lamppost without trial. Boiler repairman Ivan Hull said, I'm 53 years old and I've never seen anything like it in Canada. It makes me think of the Ku Klux Klan. End quote. For the rest of 1963, the FLQ targeted military, government, and RCMP buildings, monuments to British colonialism, including that of Queen Victoria, infrastructure like reservoirs, train tracks, bridges, and radio towers. However, the group was not above targeting ordinary Quebecers. They knew the power of fear. On May 17, 1963, the FLQ placed 10 bombs in as many residential mailboxes in the town of Westmount. Each bomb consisted of four dynamite sticks. Five of those 10 bombs exploded near 3 a.m. in the morning. According to La Presse, quote, Sergeant Walter Leha, 42, defused a first bomb placed near a school, then a second one on a busy street. At the third mailbox, the bomb exploded in his hands. Leha, seriously mangled and very severely disabled, spent his few remaining years living in seclusion at the Veterans Hospital where he died in 1972. End quote. Over the years of their reign of terror, the FLQ funded their activities through theft and robbery. To make their bombs, they stole thousands of dynamite sticks from construction companies around Quebec, and for cash, they robbed banks and armored cars. They even hit the Canadian military. On January 30, 1964, between 7.30 and 9, the FLQ performed a large robbery of armaments from the barracks of the Fusiliers Mont-Royal Regiment located in Montreal. The arms stolen were worth about $20,000. 
59 Belgian semi-automatic rifles FN 7.62 by 51 millimeter NATO, four Bren rifles, 34 Sten submachine guns, four 60 millimeter mortars, three bazooka rocket launchers, some grenades, five Browning automatic revolvers, 13,000 bullets, 22 caliber, 2,000 7.62 caliber bullets, and 2,300 303 caliber bullets, as well as 15 radio transceivers with two portable phones, headlamps, electrical wires, one Gestetner stencil duplicator with sheets, etc. They later used the duplicator to help distribute their newsletter Le Cogne, or The Hatchet. People began referring to the group as Felquistists. The military was determined to harden its installations around Montreal and posted extra armed guards outside all their properties in the city. The FLQ simply adjusted their aim towards softer targets outside the city to acquire more armaments. On February 20, 1964, between 7.46 and 11.15, the FLQ performed an arms and equipment robbery from the barracks of the 62nd Artillery Regiment in Shawinigan. The stolen material was estimated at $25,000. 33 semi-automatic rifles, FN 7.62, pistols, a good quantity of bullets, 12 transceivers, one stencil duplicator, again, combat uniforms, and UN blue helmets. Now they were really well armed. In May 1964, eight members of the FLQ were charged with a total of more than 50 offenses, but the bombings, robberies, and attacks continued. In June of 1964, supplied by arms stolen from the Canadian military, the FLQ created what effectively would become their own army, called the Armée Révolutionnaire du Québec, ARQ, which was led by Francois Sherm. On August 29, 1964, the ARQ attacked the International Firearms Armory in Montreal. The manager, Leslie McWilliams, 56, was shot dead by one of the robbers, Edmund Gwinnett. A clerk, Alfred Pinnish, 37, was later killed in the ensuing shooting that happened between the Felquistus and the police who arrived at the scene. Le Cogne, the FLQ newsletter, weighed in on McWilliam's death. Quote, Leslie McWilliams was the victim of his own stupidity. At the beginning of the attack, the chief commando presented himself unequivocally as a member of the revolutionary movement. The man should have wisely decided not to interfere. On the contrary... As a good Anglo-Saxon, he opposed the action of the commando. This latter therefore struck down the collaborator. Notice to amateurs. End quote. Over the next few years, the violence continued. In February of 1965, the FBI and the U.S. Pentagon became interested in the FLQ when they got wind of a plan by the U.S.-based Black Liberation Front and the Felquistists to dynamite the Statue of Liberty and other American monuments. In May of that year, a bomb exploded at the United States Consul, located in Montreal. On May 5, 1966, Therese Morin, a 64-year-old secretary, was mortally wounded by the explosion of a letter bomb at La Grenade Shoe Factory. She died in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. Later that same year, on July 14, Jean Corbeau, a 16-year-old student, died while accidentally setting off a bomb he was laying at a Dominion textile factory located in the St. Henri neighborhood in Montreal. On September 12, 1967, two bombs exploded at McDonald High School in St. Anne de Bellevue. A month later, a bomb exploded at a 7-Up factory during a worker's strike. Because that's what real men do is bomb high school. Yeah, right? I don't understand. <laughs> like, I why guess, bomb a high school? Right? You bomb a high school because it's got an Anglophone name. That's, this shows the ridiculousness of this. Kids go there, right? Children. Yeah, horrible. But I guess that's the idea of the terrorist, is to create terror. Right. Over the span of 1968, 11 bombs went off in seven separate incidents, including another at the United States Consul in Montreal. Fleeing prosecution, later in 1968, some prominent members of the FLQ who'd been identified by the RCMP fled to Cuba, a communist nation friendly with them and supportive of their cause. They continued planning and organization of the attacks from outside the country. 
There were plenty of FLQ supporters and group leaders still in Quebec who were more than willing to carry out further activity. And carry it out they did. On February 13, 1969, a bomb exploded at the Montreal Stock Exchange, seriously injuring 27 people. Also in 1969, during a violent demonstration organized by the Taxi Liberation Front, a security guard shot at the crowd and shot down a plainclothes police officer, Robert Dumas. On June 24, 1970, Jean d'Arc Saint Germain, a 50 year old public servant, was killed in a bomb explosion at Defense Headquarters in Ottawa. Despite their best efforts, police could not keep ahead of the FLQ who seemed to be gaining in desperation and willingness to take things as far as they could. The pressure to stop the violence was immense. The Canadian and Quebec governments were doing all they could, but the FLQ's message was being heard loud and clear by some. It was at the beginning of October 1970 that the country had had enough when the group stepped over yet another line, this time kidnapping James Richard Cross, the British Trade Commissioner in Montreal, and later Quebec Provincial Cabinet Minister Pierre Laporte, who was subsequently murdered during his captivity. And we'll take a break right here. And we're back. What are your thoughts, Matthew? I'm thinking a lot of our listeners not from Canada Mm -hmm. are sitting there stunned like, this is Canada? We thought you were boring. By October 1970, the FLQ's violence had caused the deaths of six people. 20 FLQ members were already behind bars, including those involved in a few of the murders. Others were awaiting trial, but had been released on bail. The remaining members of the group concocted a plan to kidnap British Trade Commissioner James Cross and hold him hostage to demand the release of fellow FLQ members being held in prison. They put their plot into action on the morning of October 5, 1970. It is believed that two female members of the FLQ were stationed outside Cross's home at 1297 Redpath Crescent in Montreal to ensure the Trade Commissioner was at home and had not gone out for his early morning walk. The four kidnappers, Jacques Cosset-Trudel, Marc Carboneau, Jacques Langteau, and Pierre Seguin, arrived by cab at 8.20 a.m. When the kidnappers knocked on the door, Cross thought it might be someone from the hydro company who'd come to read the meter. His maid went to answer it. Cross was between his bedroom and the bathroom, getting ready for his day. The following account of what happened next comes from James Cross himself in his memoirs written in the years after the kidnapping. Quote, I then heard raised voices but did not pay much attention as our maid was inclined to speak loudly sometimes to her small child. The next thing I knew, I was walking back towards the bathroom, dressed only in a shirt and underpants. A man came through from the opposite side holding a gun and said, Get down on the floor or you'll be fucking dead. I backed into the bathroom, lay on the floor, and he made me turn over onto my face and put handcuffs on me. Our Dalmatian dog was sitting on the bed beside my wife and started to growl, and he told her that if she let the dog move, he would shoot it. He then called out to another man who came up the stairs into the bedroom carrying a submachine gun and shepherding the maid and her daughter in front of them. The first man then took me into the dressing room beyond the bathroom, put my trousers and shoes on, and slipped a jacket over my shoulders. He then led me back through the bedroom. My wife said, You must let me say goodbye to my husband and came over and kissed me goodbye. They tore the phones out of the sockets beside the bed and told my wife that she must not phone anybody for an hour. I was then taken downstairs, where there was a third man also armed. We went out through the front door, and there was a taxi sitting outside the house. The only other person I could see was a gardener collecting leaves on the far side of the road. I was pushed into the taxi and shoved down between the front and back seats and a rug thrown over my head. Then we drove for about five to ten minutes and stopped in what was clearly some sort of garage or workshop. I was taken out, made to stand against the wall with my eyes closed, and a gas mask with the eyepieces painted black was placed over my head. I was then taken back and pushed into another car in the same position between the seats, and we drove for possibly 15 to 20 minutes. We finally drew up in what was clearly the garage of a house. 
I was taken out, led upstairs, the handcuffs were transferred from behind my back to the front, and I was put lying down on the mattress in a room. My gas mask was removed and a hood placed on my head. I asked them what their intentions were, and they said I would have to wait and see. Later that morning, they read me their manifesto, which included the demands for the release of political prisoners, etc. Cross was told that if the demands were not met, he would die and should prepare himself mentally in case of that eventuality. Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau's cabinet denied the demands of the kidnappers and refused to release the previously convicted FLQ members. Newly elected Quebec Premier Robert Bourassa agreed with Trudeau, saying that it would be wrong to give in to the kidnappers' demands, which included the release of the 23 political prisoners, $500,000 in gold bullion, and, and a plane to Cuba. It was a bad place politically, especially as Cross was an economic representative of another country. But the government stuck to their guns, determined to solve things another way. Between October 7th and 10th, 1970, police made almost 1,000 raids and searches in an effort to find James Cross. They were not successful. According to William Tetley's book, The October Crisis, on Thursday, October 8, 1970, at 10.30 p.m., the FLQ 1970 Manifesto was read on Radio Canada Television by Gaetan Montreal. As compared with the FLQ Manifesto of the 16th of April, 1963, it was not academic in style, but was written in popular street language. It emphasized a workers' revolution more than the separation of Quebec from Canada, and it contained criticisms of the church. The manifesto was very long and does not hold one's attention throughout. After the reading, Montreal declared, quote, It was a very bad commercial. End quote. The FLQ provided proof that James Cross was still alive and extended its deadline for its demands to be met to the 10th of October at 6 p.m. Otherwise, the cell said it would execute James Cross. René Lévesque, leader of the People's Party of Quebec, called on the Quebec government to save the hostages by meeting the FLQ's demands. But the government refused. On the 10th of October, Quebec's Minister of Justice, Jérôme Choquette, held a press conference at 5.40 p.m. to respond to the kidnappers' demands. Choquette said that if Cross were released, the members of the FLQ liberation cell responsible for the abduction would be granted safe passage out of Canada but none of their other demands would be met. He said, quote, No society can consent to have the decisions of its judicial and government institutions challenged or set aside by the blackmail of a minority, for that signifies the end of all social order. This lack of movement inflamed the leadership of the FLQ even further. After the 6 p.m. deadline came and went, it was unclear whether James Cross was still alive. Shortly afterward, two masked members of the Chenier FLQ cell kidnapped Quebec Minister of Labour and Minister of Immigration Pierre Laporte while he was playing football with his nephew on his front lawn in St. Lambert. The group had found Laporte's address in the phone book. So I was reading about this, and I think the group originally wanted to kidnap a U.S. ambassador or somebody like that. Okay, or, yeah. Or a higher-ranking official, but because of the cross-kidnapping by the other subgroup, Mm -hmm. There's kind of a bit more of a lockdown on this higher ranking people. Sure. And Laporte, unfortunately, lived close to where they were holed up. Yeah. So it was sort of, uh, okay, we'll take this guy. He, he should be handy. Yeah. Well, so, let's look him up in the phone book. Poor guy. The next day, October 11th, 1970, as other officials in the region heard of Laporte's kidnapping, they flooded police with requests for special protection. To prove that Laporte was alive, the Chenier cell released two letters they'd had Laporte write out longhand. One was addressed to Laporte's wife, the other to Premier Robert Bourassa. The Chenier cell took a harder line stating that if all their demands were not met by 10 p.m. that evening, their prisoner would die. The premier gave a statement that he was not prepared to meet the kidnappers' demands. However, he was open to further negotiations. Laporte, subsequently, was given a reprieve by his captors pending further talks. On October 12, 1970, it became apparent that there were communication problems between the two FLQ cells. The liberation cell 
issued a communique saying that Cross and Laporte would be released if the 23 FLQ prisoners were freed, and they demanded that police cease all actions against the FLQ. The Chenier cell was still demanding more for Laporte's release, contradicting the other group. That same day, in a move to protect the Montreal and Canadian Parliament buildings and federal officials in Ottawa, armed troops were deployed to the streets of those cities. From Darcy Janesh's The Making of the October Crisis, quote, The kidnapping of Pierre Laporte led to the biggest manhunt up to that time in Quebec history. Over 3,500 officers from the Montreal and provincial police forces searched private residences, conducted roadside spot checks, and sorted through hundreds of tips provided by the public. Plain clothes officers watched the downtown metro stations closest to the radio station CKLM and CKAC, as well as the Longay station on the South Shore. Although one of the suspected kidnappers was spotted on three occasions, he gave the cops the slip each time. On October 13, 1970, before entering a building, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau gave an impromptu interview to Tim Ralph of the CBC. Ralph questioned Trudeau on the wisdom of deploying armed troops in a free country such as Canada. Trudeau defended his decision, saying, quote, Our duty as a government is to protect government officials and important people in our society against being used as tools in this blackmail. End quote. Ralph countered, I still go back to the choice that you have to make in the kind of society that you live in. Trudeau responded, Yes, well, there is a lot of bleeding hearts around who just don't like to see people with helmets and guns. All I can say is go on and bleed, but it is more important to keep law and order in this society than to be worried about weak-kneed people who don't like the looks of a soldier's helmet. Ralph came back at the PM again, saying, At any cost? How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Trudeau responded with his iconic words that he'd forever be remembered for. Well, just watch me. On October 15, 1970, an FLQ support rally of 3,000 students was held at Paul Sauvé Arena at the Université de Montréal. The same day, Labour leader Michel Chartron announced that popular support for the FLQ is rising and stated, quote, We are going to win because there are more boys ready to shoot members of parliament than there are policemen, end quote. On October 16, 1970, in another bold move, P.M. Trudeau showed exactly what he meant by Just Watch Me when, at the request of Quebec Premier Robert Bourassa, the federal government enacted the War Measures Act, allowing the suspension of habeas corpus, giving wide-reaching powers of arrest to police. The city of Montreal had already made such a request the day before. These measures came into effect at 4 a.m. Prime Minister Trudeau made a broadcast announcing the imposition of the War Measures Act. This is the only time the War Measures Act has been put in place during peacetime in Canada. The vast majority, 89% of English-speaking Canadians and 86% of French-speaking Canadians, supported the introduction of the War Measures Act at the time. The FLQ did not have the support they believed they had. On October 17th, the Chenier cell announced that Pierre Laporte had been executed. He had been strangled and then stuffed in the trunk of a car and abandoned in the bush near St. Hubert Airport, a few miles from Montreal. A communique to police advising that Laporte had been executed referred to him derisively as the Minister of Unemployment and Assimilation. End quote. Yeah, uh, pe- uh, what I read was pure. Laporte was a fighter Mm -hmm. and um, he was actually strangled. I can remember being told this years ago, and I don't know why this stuck in my head. He was strangled with his own gold chain, which I think he was Catholic. He probably had a cross on it or something. Sure. Strangled with his own gold chain. Yeah. And it wasn't until years later that they said that his death was accidental, but it's still murder. If you kill somebody in the commission of a crime yeah, I call, during a kidnapping. I call bullshit. It was accidental. Right. Me. I don't understand why, why they would even bother with that. Because they're trying to like lower their already low sentences. The liberation cell claimed that James Cross was still alive that they no longer intended to kill him. However, they were still refusing to release him. They now had six demands that they wanted met. Those demands were, one, the publication of the FLQ manifesto. Two, the release of 23, quote, political prisoners. 
Three, an airplane to take them either to Cuba or Algeria, both countries that they felt a strong connection to because of their struggle against colonialism and imperialism. The rehiring of the Gare de la Palme. 450 truck drivers laid off from the private company La Palme, from whom the federal government withdrew an important postal transport contract. 5. A voluntary tax of $500,000 to be loaded aboard the plane prior to departure. And 6. The name of the informer who had sold out the FLQ activists earlier in the year. On November 6, police raided the hideout of the FLQ Chenier cell. Although three members escaped the raid, Bernard Lorty is arrested and charged with the kidnapping and murder of Pierre Laporte. On December 3, 1970, after 59 days in captivity, James Cross was released by the FLQ Liberation Cell after negotiations between lawyers Bernard Merglier and Robert Demers. Simultaneously, the five known kidnappers, Marc Carboneau, Yves Langlois, Jacques Langteau, Jacques Cosette-Trudel and his wife, Louise Langteau, were granted safe passage to Cuba by the Government of Canada after approval by Fidel Castro himself. They were flown to Cuba by a Canadian Forces aircraft. Cross returned to London, where he was welcomed by his grateful family. As things had calmed considerably, on December 23, 1970, Trudeau began the withdrawal of Canadian troops from Quebec with a return to normal date of January 5, 1971, and the emergency powers lapsed on April 30th of that year. The end of the October crisis marked the end of violent revolutionary protest in the province. On December 28, 1970, Paul Rose, Jacques Rose, and Francis Simard, the three fugitive members of the Chenier cell, were taken into custody by police and later charged with the kidnapping and murder of Pierre Laporte. By 1982, all the convicted participants had been paroled and all of those sent to Cuba had returned to Canada, some completing short sentences in Canada for their roles in Cross's kidnapping and the violence perpetrated by the FLQ. Since the FLQ's seven years of terror, there has not been any shortage of drama around separation. We have a new Constitution Act, called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. As well, we have seen two referenda, one in 1980 and one in 1995, both of which had Quebec's separation from Canada on the table. Both failed. However, the one in 1995 was a squeaker, with only 50.58% of the Quebec population wanting to stay within Canada. In October 2020, 50 years following the October crisis, Yves-Francois Blanchet, the party and parliamentary leader of the sovereigntist Bloc Québécois, introduced a motion in the House of Commons demanding an official apology from the federal government, now led by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, son of Pierre Trudeau, for invoking the War Measures Act in 1970. The apology was not made. Multiple commissions have been held to determine what happened, what could have been done better, and what we could do to prevent such violence again. Currently, Canada has more than 70 groups on its terrorism watch list, including the homegrown Proud Boys, a far-right neo-fascist and exclusively male organization that promotes and engages in political violence in the United States and Canada. And that's it for Dark Poutine episode 189, the FLQ, Seven Years of Terror and the October Crisis. What are your thoughts on this, Matthew? You know, I didn't know a lot of these details, right? Mm -hmm. it, um, yeah, we heard about it a little bit in school, but we are never taught. And maybe it was because it was too soon after, I don't know. Right. But we didn't, we were never taught sort of the details. A lot of the textbooks I had in school were from the seventies and even the sixties. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there, the textbooks wouldn't have been written. It wasn't, at that wasn't in the cur curriculum yet. Yeah. Which is interesting. Like it's an important world event that you think that we should have been talked, talking about a little yeah. bit more, yeah. but we weren't. And you know where I come from, the FLQ, like. I didn't know they were a Marxist-Leninist group. Yeah. Where I come from, it was, quote, the French. Right. Right. And I think you point out, right, it's separatists are not terrorists. No, right? they are not. At all. And, you know, and I'll talk, you know, you know me, I'm not a centrist at all. I actually think um, that provinces should have greater powers for themselves. Mm -hmm. I'd actually go down to the county level like they do in Switzerland with the cantons. But... You know, in the 70s, it was, quote, the French, right. which is horrible, right? And, um, you know, and you have to, you know, and this shit went on in, for different 
in different ways, like even after the last referendum in 1995. Yeah, that was a squeaker. And uh, Parti Quebecois leader Jacques Perezo stated, we were beaten, it's true, but what, by what basically? By money and the ethnic vote. Right. So this is, this is an interesting point because this is what I find. Um, a lot of this seems to be a protection of a culture yeah. leaning toward racism. Well, I mean, if your leader says we're beat by the ethnic vote, to yeah. me, that's a little bit of a peek behind the curtain of what's in some people's heads. Probably not the majority of Quebecers, right? but, you know, the politicians. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that that's just a disgusting statement. I think, you know, he probably regretted ever saying that because after that, it was just people were like, fuck you. you know I mean? Yeah. And we, we also see um, things like that in Quebec where um, Muslim people are particularly targeted, uh, Muslim women, for wearing a hijab, yeah. which is a part of their uh, religious uh, observance. Yeah. And um, they're not allowed to wear, or they, they are not supposed to wear a hijab if they are working in a public like as in a public service position. Provincial public service. Yeah, position. which is like, yeah. um, to me that that doesn't doesn't quite sit right with me. It's sort of strange. Yeah, I think another thing that I find strange about all of this mm -hmm. is the terrorists got off with like such light sentences. Yep. Like proof in point in two thousand and one, a guy named Real Mathieu who is a member of the FLQ had been sentenced for nine years for terrorist attacks and murder yeah. was convicted of firebombing three coffee shops, second cup coffee shops in yeah. Quebec. This is in 2001 because they were going by the English brand name, second co cup, not Demian, Deuxième, Deuxième it, Tasse, or Deuxième whatever, tasse yeah. or whatever it is in French. Yeah. And do you know how long, do you know? So he firebombed. So terrorist convicted nine years in jail. Years later, firebombed three coffee shops. Guess how long he got a sentence for, Mike? Don't know. Six months. Six months for firebombing three coffee shops. Yeah. Well. Like, what the hell is that about? I don't really understand it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's ridiculous. But I do want to say one thing. You know my love affair with Quebec. I am aware of your love. I mean, you go there half of your business. Yeah. I, and I, I've always loved Quebec. My best friend Murr lives in Quebec. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that whoever's listening to this isn't like, Ooh, I'm not going there. It is filled with a, first of all, poutine and great food. Yeah. B actually probably a should be warm people. I've always met wonderful people. The culture, the, the culture there is fantastic. Yeah. So. If you go to Quebec city, if you really want a view into, um, what the Quebec culture, the Quebecois culture yeah. is. Yeah. Go to Quebec City and see the see old Quebec. It is fantastic. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. So you know, you know this. Uh, this is sort of a historical um, conversation we had today. Yeah. And I don't want people to be put off from visiting Quebec. No, I mean this whole thing obviously happened fifty years ago. Yeah. But there's still, as I mentioned at the end, there are still people with. But, separatist sentiments, but, but what, what, there's no longer the... What provinces don't have their own problems, though? Well, Alberta seems to be wanting to separate from Canada from time to time. Uh, I don't know where that would leave British Columbia. Uh, I'm, I'm good with the American dollar. I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I don't want to be... I, I kind of... It's interesting that we can have these discussions in Canada. And although some people get very, very upset by them... Yeah. You don't have to. No. You know, it's it's part of the, this is part of what it is to be Canadian is to we, have these conversations. We muddle along somehow. Yeah. Right? But we muddle along by having the conversation. We yeah. don't hide it. Yeah. Things that we've hidden, residential schools, those kind of things are coming to light now. Yeah. And, you know? and this is proof that it'll fester until you have the conversation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at 1-877-327-5786 or one 877 dark -PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. So what did you think about my 
voicemails jingle, Matthew. You, well, you just saw me dancing, didn't you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> but, but I but people can't see you dancing. So did you like it? Yeah, it took me a little while to do, but yeah. Pretty jazzy music. Band, yeah, like. right. Like a little <laughs> little bossa nova. <laughs> All right. It looks like uh, we got a phone call from Alberta. Let's have a listen. Hi, uh, my name is Teresa. I'm calling from Okotoks, Alberta, which is just south of Calgary. It's a small town. I just wanted to call and reach out and say thank you guys so much for all that you are doing. Um, I actually have a little kind of story. Um, my dad recently passed away, and my last big memory with him, we actually drove to a town north of us called Alex, Alberta, and we listened to the Sasquatch episode, and my dad couldn't believe it. He was in complete awe um, of the whole episode. He thought that it was crazy, all the different ideas that you guys were coming up with. And I just want to thank you guys for being part of that memory. It really means a lot to me. And thank you so much for all that you do. Have a great day. And don't forget to take a shit in your hat. Bye. I'm glad that we could uh, give you that memory. Yeah. Be involved in a memory where you uh, be involved in a positive memory about your dad. That's really kind of cool. That is really nice. Yeah. That uh, that warms the... uh, Cockles of your heart. Yeah. My tiny, cold, dead heart. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Here's a message from someone from Hamilton. Hi, Mike, Matthew, and Steve. It's Linda from Hamilton, the Hammer. Longtime listener, first time caller, and I love your show. I go through withdrawals waiting for the next episode. I love you two so much better than the previous co host. Uh, I do hope Steve is doing well and give him a pet from me. Thank you for being so respectful of all the victims in these stories. Bravo to Matthew on writing episodes. They're fantastic so far. And all the best to you both. And hey, go shit in your hat. Well, there you go. Uh, It's Hammertown. You know, I went to the college in Hamilton. You went to college in Hamilton. What What did you take there? Advertising and marketing. Oh, that's a surprise at, thing is at, that's what you do for a living. At Slow Hawk College up on the mountain. Oh, wow. Well, they call it the mountain, the Niagara Escarpment. It's a hill. There you go. Yeah. Next up, we have a message from someone named Matt. <laughs> but it's not you. <laughs> How do you know it's not me? Well, I don't think it is unless you're from Bridgewater, Massachusetts. No. Okay, let's listen. Hey, Mike and Matt, this is... Matt. I'm from Bridgewater, Massachusetts, just south of Boston. I want to say I love the show. Um, been listening since the beginning. Uh, love the Halifax explosion episode. Um, love telling that story um, to people that come in. I run tours in Boston. Love telling the story of the Christmas tree in Boston. Uh, was very touched by your uh, recent episode on 9-11. I had a uh, uh, I knew a couple people on the planes. Um, I had a couple friends whose parents worked in the World Trade Center buildings. Um, so uh, you did a great job with that. So thank you. Uh, you brought a lot of, uh, I don't know what to say on that, but um, you did a good job on the episode. So thank you. Uh, I won't tell you to go shit in the hat, uh, but I will say if you do take a shit in your hat, don't forget to wipe. Oh, have a good day. Well, I thank you, other Matt. <laughs> and I like that he's from Bridgewater because that's where I grew up, but not Bridgewater, but, Massachusetts. Yeah. I grew up in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. And he does tours in Boston. Yeah. Have you been to Boston? Uh, we had family in Boston for a time. It's but a great little town. Yeah. I've never been. Some of the architecture is amazing. Yeah. My, my friend Glenn Murray played for the Bruins. Is that, is that ice hockey? That is ice hockey. Okay. You pretending to not know what hockey is. Isn't that cute? Here's one that looks like it's actually directed toward Matthew. Oh no. Um, this could be good or bad. So let's, let's have a listen. Please be good. Please be good. Hey, it's uh Casper calling and, uh, loved that one, Matthew. Absolutely loved that. You did Strathroy. Very proud. I could, uh, close my eyes and imagine everything you were describing in the town except for things before the time I moved to town, but uh, I still had a general idea of where you were describing things. Awesome podcast. Love you guys. You're the best. Number one podcast out there. And uh, I'm about to cut the grass at my mother-in-law's on uh, your old 
street, Matthew, um, just down the road where you hung out with my wife as a child. And uh, again, love the podcast and go take a shit in your duke. Love it, guys. Love it. So, you know, do you know this person, Matthew? No. Well, that's interesting. Maybe he, because he didn't identify his wife, she might identify herself to you later. I think, I think, well, somebody was writing to me recently. I can't remember his name, but anyway, I'll, yeah. I'll figure it out. Yeah, good old Dominion Street. Yeah, they're big lawns. That's a, he, so he's, if he's mowing his uh, mother-in-law's lawn, that's do, a lot of work. That's, do you think he's on a ride-on? Uh, probably not. No, probably that's not. That's a bit fancy for Strathroy. <laughs> Ride-ons are fancy for Strathroy. <laughs> oh boy, um, I I love a Thanks, good Casper. ride-on mower. I've never had one myself, but uh, I would probably get myself into trouble with that. So that's it for voicemails this week. Uh, let's move on to Patreon. 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 And I'm sure that uh, our patrons gave us some love this week because I looked prior to give us some loving. Give us some love. I'm such a bad singer. Oh boy. So first up, as far as patrons go, let's have a look. It is, oh. First up is Amy Carraz. Hello, Amy, Amy Carraz. Amy Carraz. And I don't know where Amy's from. Where's Amy from, Matthew? She's from a small town in Quebec called Notre Dame de Portage. Oh, wow. Our Our Lady of Portaging. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it for the listeners, can you explain what a portage is? Because some people might not know. Essentially, when your canoe will no longer go down the river and you need to pick it up and walk for a while, that's portaging. Exactly. Yeah. So you're moving your canoe and your equipment from one place to the other so you can continue your trip. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Portage. Yeah, so there's, I love that there's a place called Notre Dame de Portage. Yeah, that is kind of cool. <laughs> and so thank you thank very much. You. And what does, what does Amy do there in Notre Dame de Portage? She makes canoes. Of course she does. Yes. Of course she does. She's like uber Canadian. So is it birch bark yep. canoe? Oh, wow. The old, she goes old school. E oldie schooly. Yeah. I always wanted to have a birch bark canoe. I made them when I was a little kid, like little toy ones. Yeah. And they would sink. Because, <laughs> because we had was... three canoes that we made ourselves. Oh, and did they sink? No, but we made them out of fiberglass. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. Next up. We have someone with the most Canadian name I've ever heard. First name, Katrina. Last name, Hockey. No. <laughs> yes, Katrina Hockey. So what? Where, I'm skating on sunshine. The problem is Katrina Hockey is from Parsonsfield, Maine. So oh. so she's, she's not Canadian at all, <laughs> but she's got a very Canadian name. We're, we're going to make her an honorary Canadian. Right? Yeah, you have to be an honor, honorary Canadian with yeah. a name like Hockey. Yeah. Um, what does Katrina Hockey do for a living there in Parsonsfield, Maine? Yeah, of course, she's a hockey player. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You really had to think about that for a long well, time. Well, you, you can't, can't not, I can't not say that. Yeah. It's kind of impossible. She was with the uh, Canadian Olympic team. Oh. Yeah. Even though she's American. Well, we just made her an honorary Canadian. Perfect. Yeah. I like how that happens. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thanks, Katrina, Katrina Hockey. Next up, we have Amanda McCarthy. Amanda. Amanda McCarthy. Whenever I hear the name Amanda, I always think about the Bart calling in to the bar and uh, asking for different people. I need Amanda hug and kiss. Amanda hug and kiss. Oh my God. <laughs> and I'm sure Amanda appreciates you sharing that. Yeah. So Amanda <laughs> McCarthy, uh, where number one is Amanda from? She's from a small village in Quebec called Cap Sha. Cap Sha. Well, Cap. Yes. C A P Sha. Oh. C H A T. Oh, okay. So I thought it was Cap Sha, like as in no. what I have to do before I log into PayPal. No, Cap. Sha, or as the Americans say, cap shat. Okay, so it's cap. Sha. So kitty. 
Yeah, so Ian it translates to cat in the hat, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Wow. And so what does Amanda do whilst living in cat in the hat? (laughs) She's a nursery school teacher. Oh, nursery school. Yeah. Of course, probably reads cat in the hat to the kids. Yeah, that's where where it was written. That's great. Yeah. (laughs) That's where it was written. I'm sure it was. (laughs) Um, This person has an interesting username. Okay. So, uh, this next person. Is it dirty? No, it's not. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so this person's name, I do believe is Jack, J-A-Q. Okay. But her username is, what did I get today with Jack? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I don't know where Jack is from either. Newville. Newville. Quebec. Newville, Quebec. N- oh. N-E-U-V-I-L-L-E. Okay. And, and what does Jack do there in Newville, Quebec? She, hold on, ask me that question one more time. And what does Jack do there in Newville, Quebec? She sells used cars. She sells used cars? In Newville, yeah. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so should, shouldn't she be in Usedville? <laughs> <Ba-dum, bump. laughs> or Oldville? Oldville, yeah. Well, that could What's be. What's the thing. French word for old? Oh my God! What? Uh, is it lo- no? That's a long time. Uh, um, now it. Oh God! Make me sound smart. Come on, make me sound smart. Old. Viel. Viel. Or uh, if a uh, viel is masculine, uh, I- viel is feminine, and vie. Is masculine. So Vielville. Vielville. Would be Oldville. Okay, there you go. <laughs> That's funny. Or ancien. Ancienville. Like, as in ancient. Yeah. Or Ege. Or veteran. <laughs> is this France French or Quebec French? Uh, it's all French. Okay. <laughs> it's Mike French. Global French. It's global French. It's Mike can't do a French accent French. <laughs> All right, that's it for patrons. Let's see what we have for... Oh, shut up with your kids outside. (laughs) Okay, it's on to donut money. And donut money, donut money. We are back in the... Whoa, we are going back a ways for donut money. Wow, there are a few... Donut Money Donors this week. And... Okay. I guess we've been away for a while. First up, we have... Teresa Temlet. And Teresa, we're not sure where you're from, so Matthew probably knows. Temletville. Temletville. Is that in Quebec as well? Yes. We've spent a lot of time in Quebec in this episode. I'm just doing the theme. Um, Yeah, so her ancestors um, actually settled Temletville. Oh, wow. That's great. And what does she do there? She's the mayor. There you go. That's a good job. Yeah. Next up, we have Sarah Stop. And Sarah is from Denver, Colorado. Colorado, the Mile High City. Her last name is Stop. S-T-A-P-P, stop. Oh, okay. Yeah, or stop. Well, that's like, that's how Bostonite would say stop. 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 <laughs> Put on a sweater and come on over to Harvard Yard. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and she says, thanks so much for an incredible podcast that's been fulfilling. Everything I love about true crime while being so honest, open and centered on victims. Y'all are awesome. Ah, oh, that's lovely. Thank you, Sarah. And what does Sarah do there in a Denver, Colorado, Matthew? She's got to do something, I'm sure. She works on an advertising agency. Oh. Yep. There you go. What does she advertise? Uh, Wonder Bra. Oh. <laughs> but wasn't that the one with like the crossover wire thing? I can't remember how it worked. Wonder Bra, the, they did one ad. Wonderful, wonderful Wonder Bra. They did one poster with a woman looking down. Yep. And, and all the headline of the poster was Hello Boys, and it increased Wonder Bra sales like 50%. That was the only difference in their marketing. One ad, and she was responsible for that. Wow, that's great. Next up, we have Keely Cooper, 
Hello, Keely Cooper. Keely says, sending some burrito money to share with Matt from BC's Beard, Washington State. Keep up the good work. So, Keely is from Washington State, and it looks like good old Seattle. Okay. One of my favorite cities. Love Seattle. Seattle is interesting. Watching that right now, Grey's Anatomy takes place in Seattle. Oh, God. (laughs) I'm done with the R, so I had to move on to my next medical drama. Yeah, I keep on recommending good shows to you. I have to watch the brain dead things. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's it's fun. It's fine. Well, thank you, Seattle. Thank you, Keely in Seattle. And what does Keely do there in Seattle? Uh, she actually is a barber. She's a barber? Yeah. Speaking of which, I need a haircut. You do. I noticed that one. Yeah, it's getting a little fluffy. Yeah. She's a barber. There's all kinds of cool little barber shops down. Um, I can't remember the neighborhood I was there, but all these cool barber shops. Yeah. I should probably head down there. Yeah. And get, get a myself a haircut. Once the border opens. Shave come, and a haircut. Bum, bum. Come on, America. Open the darn border. Open the border. Uh, next up we have Carla Colucci. And Carla sent us a little message. Says, hello, Mike. Please accept this cashola in gratitude for your efforts in putting together a really great podcast. Many thanks from Ottawa. Uh, Canada's capital, Ottawa, which we mentioned in today's show. What does Carla Colucci do there in Ottawa? I think she is a backbencher. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So she's a... Uh, One of the parties. She's an a, MP. Yeah, MP. Junior, hmm. junior MP. Which, which... Like, is there such she thing just as a recently... junior... Is there such thing as a junior MP? Well, I guess, like recently elected yeah, MP. Yeah, she's a recently elected MP. Okay. And which party is she with? Uh, she's independent. Oh, I didn't think the independents got any seats in this election. You didn't read? <laughs> I cannot read a word. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's terrible. Anyway, that's one of those Canadian vignettes. you remember that one? No. Marzipan ointment. I cannot read a word. <laughs> Anyway, it's just... I have no idea what you're talking about. Somebody knows. Okay. Next up, we have our friend from the UK is back with a triple digit donation. Who's this? Sally Norris. Sally Norris, we love you. She says, to Mike and Matthew, it's been a while since... It's been a while. The last 18 months have not been particularly kind to me, but, but my health is now stable and I've had dark poutine to keep me company Sending much gratitude from Southern England for all the hard work you do. Keep smiling, Sally N. Well, thanks, Thanks, Sally. Sally. We missed you. Glad you're feeling better as well. I'm super glad you're feeling better and uh, a little worried now to tell you the truth. (laughs) Like what? uh, Hopefully it's not anything too serious that's been going on. Well, if she's in south of England, she'll have lots of fresh sea air to keep her her healthy. I want to go to the UK so badly. It's lovely down there. We could have gone for Crime Con, but it doesn't look like, it didn't look like it would have been a healthy thing for and us I got to my, do. I got my UK passport this I week. see that. Yeah. So you can. Yeah. I was a citizen for 16 years and just didn't get my shit together oh. to get the passport. Finally did. So, which means I can get in a lot more easily now that COVID has made getting into countries difficult. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of countries that aren't open. You know, they're still closed entirely yeah, and, to foreign. And Justin, visitors. Justin, and I both have mixed um, injections for, mm-hmm. co- and uh, the U.S. isn't allowing people in with mixed injections, which is bonkers. So we were going to go to Hawaii if we didn't go to the U.K. to mm-hmm. see my mother-in-law this Christmas. Um, if you but got a third can... injection of one of the, well, that's what I'm. I'm going to call my doctor and say, give me a booster of like the one that. I had last time, you know what I mean? Right. So if you had Moderna or Pfizer, you need to have one of those again because you had AstraZeneca first. Yeah. Bonkers. It's silly. I know. It kind of pisses me off because had I known, Mm -hmm. I would have said, you know. Give me the. Canadian government is like, yeah, I can do both. I'm like, okay. Yeah. I should have, you know, anyway, it's kind of a pain. So I think the government is going to have to be like, okay, everyone, you can get another one so you can travel. Too bad you're not like an immunocompromised person because yeah. then you can get a bur- booster right away. Well, just fake it. Yeah, <laughs> fake it till you make it. Yeah. Just go in there and go, I'm immunocompromised. I don't feel good. I shouldn't be funding that. No. Um, and that's it. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Yeah. 
Thank you to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. My book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available for pre-order via a link on the Dark Poutine website less than a month until its release on November 2nd. And speaking of our website, please check out darkpoutine.com for show notes and other cool stuff. Please take the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly... Thank you for listening and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. Until we return, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Goodbye. Goodbye.